The Guardians of the Galaxy have saved the galaxy several times. They eat alien threats for dinner, leaving enough room for an interdimensional incursion as a late night snack. Oh, yeah. They're the bad boys and girls of the MCU, but adorable enough that everyone seems to love them. With their second film, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, being released into theaters soon, we thought it would be a good time to catch up on the worst things to happen to the best of the worst teams in Marvel. While their victories have made the intergalactic headlines, their failures and hidden histories tell the rest of the story. Peter Quill, Gamora, Drax the Destroyer, Rocket Raccoon, and Groot became household names in 2014, but their first feature film only told one story in a long line of space adventures that comic readers know and love. Are you kidding me? You still haven't subscribed to CBR's YouTube channel? How many awesome videos have you missed because you forgot one click? Starting today, that number can be zero. Subscribe now. I think I'm seriously interested in that. <laughs> OG Guardians In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Guardians of the Galaxy consists of the Star-Lord, Peter Quill, Gamora, daughter of the mad titan Thanos, Drax the Destroyer, Rocket Raccoon, and his talking trunk BFF Groot. They make a pretty good team, even if they have to blow stuff up to get their point across. While all of the characters have existed in the Marvel Universe for decades, the group featured in the movies didn't even exist as an official team until 2008. Plus, when they did show up, they weren't even the first ragtag group of heroes who attempted to save the universe called the Guardians of the Galaxy. In fact, that group stole, well, borrowed is probably a better term, their name from an amnesiac, time-traveling Vance Astro. If you don't know who that is, how about his other moniker, Major Victory? No? Still not ringing a bell? Fear not, true believers! Not a lot of people do, even fans of the comic book series. In 1969, writer Arnold Drake and artist Gene Collin created a gruff group to guard the galaxy as a homage to the Dirty Dozen. They existed in the 31st century of Earth-691, an alternate timeline to the mainstream Marvel Universe that exists in Earth-616. That team consisted of the aforementioned Astro, a mutant with psychokinetic ability, Martin X Tanaga, a crystalline being from Pluto, a Jupiter-born soldier, Captain Charlie 27, and Yondu Udanta from Centauri 4. You are saying goodbye to the biggest score you have ever seen. Starhawk sucks. The MCU is about to get a whole lot more muscular when Sylvester Stallone makes his debut in the Guardian sequel. He'll be portraying Stakar of the House of Olgord, better known as Starhawk. In the comics, he is responsible for bringing together the original lineup of Guardians. He's also a bit of a pretentious D-bag, referring to himself in the third person as the one who knows. He's half human, half artificial intelligence, who was kidnapped shortly after birth and left to die. He was found, then adopted, that family was killed as he was raised by the man that killed them. During this time, he stumbled into the dwelling of a hawk god and, along with his adopted sister Alita, were merged into a being who can manipulate light. However, he was cursed to re-inhabit his infant body, reliving his life over countless times. He remembers some of his past life, but his memories are unreliable, which causes more than a few issues. Oh, did we mention he eventually falls in love with his sister, who he is currently merged with and they eventually convince the hawk god to separate them and they end up having three children. They have an on-again, off-again, merged-again relationship for a while in comics, but eventually separate, which is convenient, because Starhawk dies, again, and comes back as a female version that attempts to kill the Guardians because they aren't supposed to exist, or some other super comic booky thing. Now then put more of this liquid into our body. Drax's drunk dial. We've all done it. Well, if you're under 21, you hopefully haven't. I promise you I'll get the liquor later. But sometimes, most times, when you're under the influence, you don't make quality decisions, bothering a soon-to-be former friend with your rambling late-night voicemails. That's embarrassing, but pales in comparison to what Drax did in the first Guardians movie. Throughout the movie, Drax the Destroyer, played by Dave Bautista, is haunted by the death of his family at the hands of Ronan the Accuser, a Kree officer who takes his job soup seriously. As the team tries to catch its breath after stealing an Infinity Stone and breaking out of prison, the group finds themselves inside the giant severed head of a Celestial, charmingly named Nowhere. Sounds like a place which I would like to visit. Yeah, you should. Left to his own, Drax drowns his sorrows, but finds himself a little liquor courage and actually calls Ronan, telling him where he's at, and challenges him to a round of fisticuffs. Yeah, it, uh, it doesn't go well. Ronan shows up and gives Drax a major beatdown. Plus, Ronan's cronies chase the rest of the gang into space, almost killing Gamora and Peter Quill. Oh, Ronan also gets his hands on the Infinity Stone and heads over to Xandar and manages to wipe out a good portion of the Nova Corps. <laughs> I shall meet my foes! Drax's duplicate deaths. In comics, dead doesn't mean forever. Some, however, die more than others, and Drax is one of those poor saps that gets destroyed often. 
Why is this one here? His comic origin is slightly different than the movies. His name is Arthur Douglas, a real estate agent whose family was attacked by Thanos while they were out on a leisurely drive. His human body perishes, but his spirit is saved by Mentor, father of Thanos. Oh, boo hoo hoo, my wife and child are dead. Mentor also adopts, kidnaps? Tomato Tomato, Arthur's daughter after the crash, needs a new champion to battle his son. He places Douglas' spirit into a rockin' new bod, calling the creation Drax the Destroyer. Destroyer. After some adventures, Drax teams up with the Avengers to take down Moon Dragon, who ends up being Drax's daughter. But Drax dies again when she telepathically removes his life essence from his body. He comes back due to Thanos being resurrected, just go with it, but he retains his memories of Moon Dragon, making him a little crazy. After a mental breakdown in the microverse, he dies again where the prison ship he's on crashes, but he then steps away from the crash looking as much skinnier version of himself. He dies again while trying to kill Thanos in the Cancerverse, then shows back in another book with no mention of his previous death. Stop water, you idiot. That's disgusting. Gone Groot Gone Baby Groot is heavily featured in the new promos for the second Guardians film. He looks adorable and is surely formidable, but you probably shouldn't get too attached to him. If history is any indication, the talking tree frequently gets chopped down. You've already seen one death during the first film when Groot sacrifices himself to save his newfound friends. He creates a cage of branches to protect his team. His comic origins, however, have a whole different story bark -er arc. <laughs> He began as an alien menace in the 1960s who ends up being killed by termites. A clone is then created, but the Hulk smashes it to pieces during a battle. A splinter survives, but the newest version of Groot attacks New York and is sent to the negative zone by the Avengers. A rebooted Groot appears years later during the Annihilation Conquest storyline. New Groot suffers the same fate as old Groot, sacrificing himself so Star-Lord and Rocket can escape. A bit of a branch manages to be found and Groot regrows, only to sacrifice himself against the Phalanx again by growing and then exploding their base. Of course, Rocket kept a small piece, so Groot grew again, only to die during the Secret Wars storyline, where Peter Quill, however, kept a small sampling of the sapling and merges it with the World Tree to defeat Doctor Doom. What happens next? Groot grows. I'm Groot. Yeah, you said that. Say again? Speaking of Groot, let's talk about Groot speaking. Groot's known to only use the words, I'm Groot exclusively in that order. Limiting his ability to get his true feelings off his bark-covered chest. Thankfully, a few folks, like Rocket Raccoon, can understand what he's actually saying. His stunted speech is because his organs are stiff and inflexible, because he's a tree, and thus his larynx is hardened. While it may put a damper on his plans for a podcast, it hasn't stopped him from becoming a fan favorite. If you ever wondered what Groot was actually saying, just look back to his reintroduction in the Annihilation Conquest storyline. Upon his debut, he's shown with the ability to speak, uttering such phrases as you will pay for this indignity. Heck, even before that, he was an evil monster from Planet X in Tales to Astonish, one that openly taunted those he wanted to squash with verbal threats. At some point after the Guardians defeated the Ultron-led Phalanax in Conquest, Groot lost the ability to talk as writers Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning finalized their version of the team. The sudden lack of vocal ability is the previously mentioned larynx. It closes as Groot grows and matures. By a tree and a talking raccoon. Old! What's a raccoon? Rocket's rough past. Groot's bestie is a talking raccoon-like alien that actually understand what he's saying. Before he was known by his Rocket moniker, he appeared as Rocky Raccoon in his debut in 1976. His name was inspired by the Beatles song of the same name. He didn't show up again for a few years, appearing during a run of The Incredible Hulk and telling everyone that Rocky was short for Rocket. Though he resembles a raccoon from Earth, he is an alien from the planet Halfworld. The planet is abandoned colony for the mentally ill. Animals were experimented on, genetically manipulated to grant them human human level intelligence and the ability to walk. Eventually, he served as a top cop on the planet, but had to battle some of his friends as they began to go insane. After defeating them, he left Half-World, eventually running into Peter Quill and joining forces with the Guardians. During their time together, it's revealed that Rocket was also the subject of laboratory research by the Stranger, a cosmic scientist of sorts. A combination of these moments was used for Rocket's backstory in the film. With all these people always picking on him, it's pretty obvious why Rocket has developed quite the disdain for people and the taste for shooting big guns. I could care less whether you live or whether you die. 
Gamora's Growing Pains. The last of her kind, the awesomely named Zen Wolberus, Gamora ends up a ward of the Mad Titan Thanos. You know, a gentle soul, one who looks at an abandoned baby and decides he needs a new killing machine. Hashtag daddy issues. Thanos is a bad dad. He raised his adopted daughter to become the deadliest woman in the whole galaxy. Though, if his intent was to create a deadly daughter and she came the deadliest ever, maybe he does deserve that father of the year mug. Thanos was pretty rough on Gamora. He trained her to kill the people who murdered her family. Pretty high and mighty coming from the lackey of a genocidal maniac. Yeah, I know who you are. She was so ruthless she traveled back in time and wiped out every single member of a cult named the Universal Church of Truth, preventing their entire existence. After she finally defeats Magus, the man who killed her people, she realized her surrogate father, Thanos, is the bigger threat and attempts to take him down. He essentially kills her, but her soul is transferred to an Infinity Gem comics, bro, where she actually enjoyed a few moments of peace. She comes back to stop Thanos from forming the Infinity Gauntlet, only to be erased from existence by Thanos himself. Thankfully, her half-sister Nebula helps bring her back, and she eventually finds her way to the Guardians. Your words mean nothing to me! Mantis. Making her debut in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Mantis is high-level empath with some serious martial arts skills. She was born in Vietnam, the daughter of the sometimes terrorist Libra. After his wife was killed and his sight lost, Libra holds up with his daughter at a Vietnamese temple, which turns out to be a sect of the Kree alien race, and they think Mantis may become the Celestial Madonna. No biggies, just the most important being in the entire universe. Talk about pressure. Except that doesn't happen. Her mind is wiped and she becomes a prostitute. After meeting the swordsman and falling in love, she remembers her whole destiny to become a messiah and bails on the swordsman. He dies but gets possessed by an alien who ends up marrying Mantis. Then things get real life weird and she actually leaves Marvel Comics when creator Steve Englehart left, ending up at DC, then at Image Comics before eventually returning to Marvel. Her welcome is not warm. She turns green and starts getting new powers while hooking up with the Silver Surfer. Then she explodes. Her mind is split into fragments, and one of those fragments joins the West Coast Avengers to try and find the rest of her mind. But wait, after disappearing from the comic pages for a while, she returns in 1995's controversial anger story, The Crossing. She's now a villain who attempts to take down Earth's mightiest heroes. The story took a lot of heat due to her impregnation at the hands of the reanimated corpse of the swordsman, which isn't that bad till it was revealed her father was behind the pregnancy. The story was later retconned and never have happened. Yeah. Me. Star Lord's not so proud papas. Peter Quill, the Star Lord, isn't sure who his dad is. At least in the film version, his quest to find his dad is one of the plot points of the second Guardians movie. But not a huge spoiler as director James Gunn has already revealed who his papa is Ego, the living planet. If you're asking how a planet and an Earth female have a baby, it turns out Ego has a human form. And that human form is Kurt Russell. The ladies love Kurt Russell. In the comics, Peter has a couple of bad dad backstories. Current canon finds Peter's dad also as an alien, but he's just some King of Spartax. He's a jerk who visited Earth, knocked up a lady, then bailed. After his mom dies, Peter ends up in space and doesn't run into his dad for a while. When he does, he realizes his dad's not very cool and exposes himself in front of his entire kingdom, disgracing his dad who loses his crown. Originally, though, Peter's dad was just some dude who straight up tried to murder him when he was born. Apparently, Peter was immaculately conceived, and his dad wasn't very accepting of this fact, but suffered a heart attack trying to kill him. That entire story was thankfully retconned, explained away by alternate timelines. <laughs> Comics, bro. I wanted more, sir. You understand? What are you laughing at? Why well, can't I have a discussion with this gentleman? For a group of people who try to do good, they sure had a lot of suffering in their past. After you like this video, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. What's your favorite Guardian storyline? Be sure to share this video with your friends for the release of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2.